Durbin doing today? Yeah? I met somebody, a pastor from Jeffrey's Bay, and they wanted to make it really clear to me that that is the best part of South Africa. So, sorry for creating a competition. I, uh, actually, it was intentional. I like creating a little competition. I'm a guy, I like contest, and I like to see passion. So sometimes competition brings the best and the worst out of us. So, all right, you guys ready to jump right in? I, I'm ready to jump right in. If you want to get your Bible open to the book of Ephesians chapter 3, and I have to warn you, we're going to read a bit of Scripture. I'm not apologizing, I'm just warning you. Uh, we're going to read a bit of Scripture this morning. Um, I want to build on what we tackled last night. Uh, I want to build on that, and I want to talk about maybe, uh, I feel like it's a 30,000-foot view um, I like to talk about macro things, then I like to get down on the ground and talk about not micro in a small sense, but kind of where does this meet the road? Like, what does this actually look like? Today's session will be more from a 30,000 foot view, and I'll bring some kind of life application to it, but I'm hoping the Holy Spirit and yourself were able to, f to really listen to how it applies to your life, that we don't just live up in the clouds in 30,000 feet, but we actually find ways where this can be applied in daily life. And like I said, I love revival. I'm all about it. But I also like to see how does revival change how we do life. Not just in our head. It starts there. It starts in our heart. But it's got to be actualized and contextualized as well. So today we'll hit 30,000 foot view and we'll find some small application. But I'll let the Holy Spirit do most of the work on that. Because I just want to just kind of open up some thoughts and some ideas around, around some key words that are crucial when we talk about transformation and reformation. So if you'll join me in the book of Ephesians, go to 3. You guys are probably there, and I am getting there. Ephesians chapter 3. Now, just to give a little bit of context, the, the book of Ephesians, is, how many of you, this is your favorite book in the Bible? Yeah, how many? It, this, if it's not, it should be at the top of your list. And I know it's it kind of funny to say your favorite book when the whole Bible is good. I get it. But the book of Ephesians is considered by pretty much every scholar and theologian on the planet as the most robust, most exhortational, most encouraging book or letter that Paul wrote. There's no question. Some actually say this book is the Alps of the New Testament. It is, it is the perfection in so many ways. I love the book of Ephesians for so many reasons because it really does unpack a bigger picture and a bigger idea. And what's beautiful about it too is Paul doesn't spend any time rebuking or correcting. It's all exhortation. It's all, it's all comforting, encouraging, and inspiring. So in the book of Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10, we're going to read one verse. Now we all know this, that this verse sits in a larger context, which we won't have time to really unpack today because that would take a lifetime to try to unpack this book alone. So I'm just going to take the liberty to read one verse and just kind of talk about this, and then we'll launch from here into our next passage. So verse 10 of chapter 3. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Let's read it again. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom, say that with me, manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Now, I think it's important to talk about the word church in this passage because the word church actually means the believer. It means the person. It means you. It means the disciple, the follower, the revivalist, the reformational guy, the transformation. It means you as a person that you have a responsibility, the privilege, the opportunity, and I might imply a mandate to carry out what this verse is talking about. So what is this verse talking about? It's the manifold wisdom. Let's talk about those two words briefly. The word manifold actually means multifaceted, multidimensional. It actually can be connected to Joseph's coat of many colors in the Old Testament. The only, the modern description would be like a hologram. You ever look at a hologram and you turn it just one degree to the right, and all of a sudden you see a completely new image. The word manifold can actually be connected to that passage in the book of Revelation where the angels are around the throne of God and for all of eternity they've been saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And in that passage, they're bowing down, worshiping God. And I remember the child, when I read that passage, I thought that's got to be the most boring job in heaven. 
is to sit there and just say, holy, holy for all of eternity. Did anybody relate to me on that? It's like, why in the world would you want that job? And I actually thought they were being forced to sing holy, holy, holy. But as I've matured in the Lord and come to realize that, oh no, I think they fought for that job. I think they actually, angel were elbowing each other. Maybe some of them got, I don't know, something happened. I think they fought to be the angel that was sitting there staring at God for all of eternity. And every time God would reveal a nature or an aspect of himself, the response was, holy, holy is the Lord. And they're bowing down. And then when they look back up at him, God has revealed another part of him. And he's been doing that for all of eternity. And he's never once duplicated himself. Imagine that. I think OMG started in heaven. <laughs> I, I think this is what happened in heaven. They're like... And they take a picture, and they're texting their entire phone book, their contact list, OMG. And by the time they push sent, they look up again, and God just revealed something else. So they've just been OMGing for all of eternity. <laughs> That's where the word, oh, my God, originated, or that phrase. So the word manifold means multidimensional, multifaceted. It's this idea that it never ends. And one of the challenges we have with the word multidimensional is we are very much stuck in a dimension. We don't have the human capability to, because of, our, because of the spiritual realm, we have access to it. But in a very natural sense, we have a very challenging time with anything that's multidimensional. It, it, it kind of violates reason. It violates logic. It violates philosophy. It violates everything. And we spend a lot of our time trying to flatten a multidimensional God. And it's what we do. We try to flatten them. We try to make sense of them. And, but if you actually look in a very natural sense, when you were conceived and you, when you were being formed in your mother's womb, something multidimensional was and is taking place. You see, if you and I were God, let me back up. If I was God, if I were to create a human being, I would start from one end and go all the way to the other end. I would start with the head or I start with the feet. And I would go, okay, this is how we do it. We're going to create a human being from the bottom up or the top down. But that is not how we're actually formed. When we're conceived, something takes place inside your mother and your mom. And what happened is they say the first fully functioning organ in the body is the heart. Once the heart is created, then the rest of the body grows from that point out. So in many ways, it is multidimensional. It actually grows in every direction, in, in, in flesh and tissue, ligament, and the story, and, the, and all of it begins to shape. So even God created you in a, if you'll allow me, a multi-dimensional aspect. He is not a A, B, C, D, E, F, G God. He can be, and sometimes he has to be just to get us to listen to him. But how many have noticed in your own life, your life did not, has not followed an A, B, C, D, E, F, G path? You mean, you figure out, you, you got A down, you got B down, and then God's like, okay, now I'm going to take you to the, to the numbers. And you just figured out how, how A and B. So you're thinking C is next. And God's like, nah, now I'm going to take you over to numbers, and I'm going to start you out at 99, and then we're going to jump to the number 50, then we're going to jump to 320, and you got you, then you finally get in the rhythm, oh, okay, now God's kind of all over the map. And then he introduces Roman numerals to you. And you don't know what an X is. You don't know a V is. How many of that's kind of your life? You think you've got it figured out. You finally figured God out, and you've got this path. And the challenge that we have is God prophesies over our life. He gives us a word, and everyone unintentionally and understandably attaches an expectation of how that word is going to come to pass. It's what we do. It's human nature. Like, oh, I know, I know how that's going to look. And we automatically do A, B, C, D to get to that prophetic word. And God's like, no, no, no. I'm going to take you over to Roman numerals for a season. I'm going to introduce you to a whole different way of living. And all of a sudden, we're all, and so in many ways, our life it has, has a multidimensional aspect to it. There's no, sometimes there's no rhyme or reason, but in context of the way God thinks, it makes perfect sense. So this is why it's crucial that we truly submit our life to him. And we truly submit ourselves to him because he is the one that's ultimately in charge. So the word manifold carries that multidimensional, it just anything could happen type of feel. Now the word wisdom in this passage actually means the intelligence of God. So the multidimensional intelligence, the, the, the smart, the, the brilliant, I would imply the genius of God. The genius of God. 
But what's fascinating doesn't end there, that the multidimensional, intelligent genius of God is to be made known by who? Us, you and me, as individuals, and obviously corporately as well. What's fascinating is not to reveal it to mankind, it's to reveal it to principalities and powers, which is really interesting. It's, to me, this verse is very heavy on spiritual warfare. And we're going to talk about spiritual warfare, but not probably the kind that you are thinking about right now that involves shofars, tambourines, and flags, <laughs> and flask of oil standing on mountaintops. Now, we still do that. My mom does that. My mom is, is the queen of that she, but she smiled and laughed while she's stabbing the air with her spears. I mean, she, that is my mother. My mom, my mom is a very unique individual, and I love my mother. She is, and things change when she simply does her whatever. She, she's got this like seven to eight foot sword that she's traveled the world with and done. God told me to go to the border of this country, and, I'm, and I went bought my, my sword, I mean, it's massive, <laughs> brought my oil, and he told me, to, and she does it, and things change. And I love it. So there, that is a spiritual warfare, but there's more to spiritual warfare than just that expression. So today, I actually want to, uh, and for me, I want to convey to you, there is a spiritual warfare involved when you and I actually reveal the genius of God. And Psalm 67, 1 and 2, you don't need to turn there, but it says this, God, let your face shine upon me so that the nations may come to you. Let your face shine upon me so that the nations may come to you. This is, this is pretty profound that David, in an Old Testament, Old Covenant reality, understood a New Testament truth. This is what made David stand out above men and women of his day. This is what made Abraham stand out. But David coined it so perfectly. That's in Psalm 67 and Psalm chapter 68. I think it's verse 19. I know it's right page, right column, bottom of the page, right there. <laughs> and David says something to this effect. He said, God, you're not after my sacrifices. You're not after bulls with hoods and horns. You are after my heart. And that allowed David to actually penetrate through a cultural norm, and he lived in a world, a reality, that was actually reserved for another day. But because he broke through, he understood, he actually pulled a future concept, reality, into his present day. Abraham did the exact same thing. How in the world did Abraham walk in righteousness when righteousness was not even going to be made available to all of mankind till after the cross? But it's simply because Abraham looked at stars and he believed. And God said, oh, this guy believes me. And he told all of heaven, hey, that righteousness thing, we're going to break the rule and give it to him now. So what's fascinating about that, you were actually able to push through, if you will, and pull an idea from another time, another day, and pull it into your current reality. People ask, is the kingdom now or the kingdom later? I always say it's both. See, in the kingdom, once you've seen it, that means you can have it. You may not possess it, but if you see it, guess what? You have access. You have the choice to go after that very thing. And what we fail to do, our, our weak theology is usually comes from we've seen something, but we didn't attain it in our lifetime. So we water down our theology and we say, oh, that wasn't for now. That's for later. No, I actually believe that once you're in the kingdom, what you see, you have access to, and you can live in it then and now. And it's, it's an easy scapegoat, an easy escape message. Say, well, that must be for another generation. True, it may be, but guess what? David proved otherwise. Abraham proved otherwise. And Moses actually stepped in the realm of the presence and glory that I don't know if it's quite been duplicated. It probably had been duplicated since Moses, but the point is it's not generally duplicated in the body of Christ, the way Moses stepped into a dimension of God that we all long for. I'm getting way off track, so I need to come back. So the manifold wisdom of God, the intelligence, the genius of God is to be revealed by the church to the principalities and powers. What's fascinating about that, oftentimes when we talk about principalities and powers, to be very clear, they are real. This is not some made-up idea. There are principalities and powers that work. Now, the challenge for the Christian, for most Christians that I interact with, we don't like the idea that some unknown power had the ability to affect us and change us. 
And we're like, no, not, not, I'm not underneath any principality and power. Now, regardless of where you land on that, my point isn't to, to, make, to get an accurate theology, but I want to tell you something that might be a little bit more easier for you to chew on to realize that it does have an effect on you, but maybe not the way that you think. Is it some dark spirit that rules over you? Possibly not. But let me, let me ask you a question. Would you say that principalities and powers shape culture? If you don't know, I just want to imply to you, yes, it does. Principalities and power actually shape a culture. And guess what? You are a product of a culture. So at some point, you are affected by this reality. Now, I'm not saying that in a doom sense that we are underneath something, but we are affected and impacted by the way a culture is shaped and affected by principalities and powers. So here we have, a, we have an amazing verse, and we're going to unpack it more as we go into the Old Testament. The idea that we have the ability to display the genius of God, the brilliance of God, that sends a message to the principalities and powers whose boss and it was simply was revealing who God is. Now I want you to go with me to the book of Colossians. We're going to read a real quick passage in Colossians. Part of me wants to skip it, but I, I don't think I should. So go to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to read kind of quickly. Go to verse 15. And we're going to read through verse 19. And I'll make reference to verse 27. Verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Let's pause right there. This is a loaded verse. It defies logic and reason. It, it defies human understanding. But if I can simplify this just for right now, the best way I can describe this verse, that no matter how you slight anything in existence, you will find Jesus at the center and at the core of it. In verse 17, it says that he is before all things, and in him all things consist. He is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning from the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence, which means superiority. So the idea that G everything was created by Jesus, for Jesus, and through him. So everything essentially comes back to Jesus. So whenever you hear messages around the centrality of Jesus, this is one of the key passages that emphasizes that and improves the case that Jesus is the center of everything. Everything originated for him, by him, and through him. So the whole idea of Jesus being the head and the center of everything in life is not some great idea. It is the reality. We can choose to realize it or completely debunk it if we want. So verse 19 is the verse I wanted to pull before we go next. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. It pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. What an amazing verse. What an amazing verse for so many reasons that at some point, God thought, I want my entire self to be in my son Jesus. Yeah. And this is why Jesus was able to say when he walked the earth, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am an exact replication of the entirety of my Father. So this is why we can look at Jesus, study his life, and we get an exact image of the Father. There isn't any, there isn't any shadow or difference. It, it is the exact replication of who Jesus was. Because in this verse, God said, I want all the fullness. Now, how many understand fullness is very different in the kingdom than it is in the natural? For example, I am still full from eating breakfast. So full in a natural sense is I've maxed out, I've hit my limit, I'm done. The fullness in the kingdom essentially means this. There's no beginning and there's no end. That's what the fullness means. If you go to the book of Isaiah, it's about his government has no end. The increase of a government has no end. Now, that is a really hard word for us to comprehend. How does something not have a beginning, and how does something not have an end? Why? Because you and I are in the dimension of time and space. We understand things have a beginning and have an end. So anything that supersedes that, it's like, how is that even possible? And it's still challenging. I remember the child, I grew up in the church, and I remember in children's church, they started talking about the word eternity. And I remember going home as a young boy thinking, it did, my brain could not comprehend the idea that something went on forever. I was like, how is that even possible? And it had no beginning. But that's what the word fullness means. Wow. And there's actually another passage in the, in the Old Testament talking about his train fills the temple. What that actually means is the train filled the temple and it's going to continue to fill the temple. 
So we have to understand that the fullness of God that actually lives in us, which is revealed in verse 27, which is a famous verse that some of you probably have a bumper sticker, T-shirt, maybe even a tattoo. And it's the Christ in you is the hope of glory. So this whole idea of, of the fullness of God living in Jesus actually lives inside of you. So I, I know I'm talking quickly, but I want to get to some other passages here. So what we have to realize is you and I have the responsibility, we have the mandate, and we have the beautiful opportunity to display the genius of God. Okay, whew, that was a lot of talking in just 10 minutes. Now I want you to go to, uh, let me see, I've got a few more things I want to lay out here. Let's see here. In... Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, you don't need to turn there unless you want to. You can write it down. It said, Jesus is the wisdom and the power of God. Jesus is the wisdom and the power of God. So we have, a um, for our house, for our movement, I have a dream, and this is the dream that I'm dreaming about for a number of years. And I would love to see the church, the body of Christ, be able to walk in wisdom and in power, not just one or the other. And what, what you'll find, which is more common, is you'll find a church or community of believers, they maybe walk more in power than in wisdom. And then you find another group, another community of believers, and they walk in wisdom and not in power. And for some reason, we, we, I don't know how it all came about, but we have people that, oh, I'm going to go after power, or I'm going to go after wisdom. And we have to go backwards a little bit to understand that that's, that's wonderful, but at the same time, it's not the entire plan of the Lord. The Lord was to reveal the wisdom and the power of God. And Jesus Christ, if you study his life fully, you'll actually see him walking in wisdom and walking in power. And he did it seamlessly. It wasn't like he thought, do I walk in power here or do I walk in wisdom here? No, he did it seamlessly. So I dream of a church. I dream of a community of believers that walk in the wisdom of God and in the power of God. Now turn with me to Proverbs chapter 8. Now we're going to focus on the word wisdom. The challenge with the word wisdom, sometimes when I teach this, I don't even mention the word wisdom until I have to because when I say the word wisdom, a lot of people think good advice. It's good instruction. It's, it's what my grandpa, whatever he says, that's wisdom. Whatever someone older than me, the wiser person, they have gray hair, that makes them more wiser. And that's what we think in a modern context of the word wisdom. We think of someone that's just smarter than us or had lived life longer than us. So I want to do, I want you to stay with me. I want to go deeper in that word wisdom. It is good advice. It is instruction. It is all that. But that's very, not to be negative, but that's very surface of the word wisdom. It's actually much greater and much deeper than that. So what I want to share with you today, I believe, is crucial. It is necessary for true reformation and true transformation. So in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 21, we're going to read about wisdom, or 22, sorry. The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way. Before his works of old, I have been established from everlasting. From the beginning, before there was ever an earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains, abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled. Before the hills, I was brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth or the fields or the primal dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When you do a circle on the face of the deep, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit, so that the waters would not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I would be beside him as a master craftsman. I want you to make note of that phrase, master craftsman, because we're going to revisit that in a few minutes again. And I would daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his inhabited world. And my delight was with the sons of men. It's an amazing passage on wisdom. The whole book, Proverbs, is about wisdom. But this right here t reveals something that's essential and important as we talk about reformation and transformation. So here we have a description of creation being created. And wisdom says, I was there beside him. So as the Lord said, as God said, let there be light, wisdom was there to make sure it actually worked. 
And if you study creation at all, the actual sequence of creation was brilliant in that you couldn't take day two and make it day three and take day three and make it day two because nothing would have lived. So the actual sequence of creation in itself was done to perfection and it, what, it actually allowed it to be sustainable and it actually allowed it to still be functioning even this many, who knows how many thousands and thousands and thousands of years later. But what's fascinating me is wisdom identifies itself as a master craftsman. So we have to understand wisdom is not just a good instruction or good advice. It's actually the very creative force that created creation. The Lord said, let there be light, and wisdom was involved in making sure it functioned. So let me propose to you, wisdom had the ability to take something that is of nothing and to make it of value and to make it into something. Okay, I'm going to let that one sit for a moment. Now I want you to go to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah is a, a little bit later in the book. It always takes me a moment to find it. I got a new Bible, and I'm still getting used to turning, turning to it. But Zechariah chapter 1, it's always awkward when you can't find, there it is. Zechariah chapter 1. We're going to read uh, verses 18. Are you guys still with me? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I know I'm, this is more of a teaching lecture, but just bear with me. Uh, Zechariah chapter 1, verse 18. So here we have Zechariah. He had this vision. And so we're going to read part of it in 18. Then I raised my eyes and looked, and there were four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these? So he answered me, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. Notice the word craftsman right there. The reason why we read the passage in Proverbs 8 is to show you wisdom in the word craftsman is almost synonymous throughout the Old Testament. If you actually look at Scripture, the Old Testament largely emphasizes the word wisdom. There's a lot of power, especially in the book of Exodus, when you have the plagues and signs and wonders for the nation of Israel leaving Egypt and the wilderness. You have a lot of that, Elijah. So there's definitely a demonstration of power in the Old Testament. However, the main, one of the main emphases or themes of the Old Testament is the word wisdom. And then in the New Testament, one of the main themes is the word power. So this is a beautiful imagery, beautiful idea that there's wisdom and power, and Jesus encompasses all of it, and he demonstrates it. So the word craftsman is mentioned here in verse 20. Let's go to verse 21. And I said, what are these coming to do? So he said, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could lift up his head, but the craftsmen are coming to terrify them, to cast out the horns of the nation that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. Okay, let's stop right here. I want to talk about this story a little bit. So we have this, we have this scene, this vision, and Zechariah sees these horns. Now, the word horn actually means demonic strongholds. It actually means a demonic stronghold. And if, you, if we read the rest of the story, what we have happening here is the oppression from the demonic stronghold, the principalities empowered, if you'll allow me to say that. It's actually the result of that is the nation, their heads were down. Whenever you see someone walking down the street with their shoulders sagging and their head down, it's a pretty good indication they're either having a bad day, a bad week, potentially a bad life. Something is on them literally. With people that have hope and vision, they never stare at the ground. They always look forward. Wow. It's always the case. I've never found someone that is full of hope and life staring at the ground. You won't find it. It's actually a, a normal physical response to hope and vision. And people that stare at the ground for most of their life, in my opinion, are oppressed by something. They may not realize it, might not want to admit it, but when you're full of hope and vision, you never stare down. You always look ahead and you always look up. It's a physical response to hope and vision. So here we have this picture of a nation. Their heads are down because of the oppression of demonic strongholds. So Zechariah sees this scene, and then over to the side, he sees four craftsmen, which is so funny because it's not the word craftsman. I would never, if, if I were to sign up for a battle and I were to bring my best warrior to the battle, I would not bring craftsmen. Yeah. I would bring gladiator. Russell Crowe, I would bring him. I would bring King David. I would bring men and women that are warriors. I'd say, now go defeat those strongholds. But in this vision, it's craftsmen. Now, the word craftsmen, as I in a very short time, 
The word craftsman is synonymous with the word wisdom. It is very much, you can't separate the two in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament. But if you could, I'm going to try to stay in the Old Testament. You can't separate the two. So what's the idea that the craftsmen have the ability to create and do things in such a way that reveal the genius of God? There is a revelation that comes from your life when you're operating in the wisdom of God in its purity and its depth and its width that whatever you do has the ability to send a message to the principalities and powers at rule of that day of whose boss. So we have these craftsmen coming in. Now, when we think of warfare, we often think of what I alluded to earlier, shofars, oil, and all that stuff, which has its place. I will never diminish that or negate that. But we often think, then they must have came in and just sliced up the, the heavenly word. No, I don't think they did. This is my interpretation of this passage. The word craftsman, it's clear, and we're going to study Exodus in just a moment. The word craftsman is somebody in this, in this ancient context was somebody that could create something with metal, with wood, with fabric. They could build something. They were, actually were industry people. They were people that could create something. They ran businesses. They built, they built structure. They, they invented stuff. They designed cups. They, they invented things of everyday use. That's what a craftsman was in this day. They were the people that built stuff that you and I could use every day of our life. That's what craftsmen were. Master craftsman was someone that reached the peak of his industry and was considered the best of creating something. So here you have these four craftsmen. What are they good at? They're good at making things. They're good at running a business. They're good at creating. They're entrepreneurs. They know how to create stuff. That's what a craftsman is. Yeah. Now today, the word craftsman, actually in a modern context, this is my interpretation, so give me some slack on this, but my interpretation of a modern craftsman is simply this, someone that is excellent at what they do. Someone they give their entire life to be excellent at it. That is a modern day craftsman. So here's my interpretation to understand. These craftsmen came into the battle and all they did would do what they did with excellence. I don't know if there was any rebuking of the stronghold. I don't know if there was any slashing in the air of these swords. I don't even know if there was any of that. I think they simply stepped into the scene and simply revealed the genius of God in what they did. And that right there sent a message to the principalities and powers that were oppressing a nation. And they realized they lost the battle. Paul actually said this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, I think it's verse 6 and 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. The whole idea around that passage is this, that the demonic stronghold will actually see what grace does to people, and it sends a message for ages to come of whose boss? Of the power of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is throughout the Bible the idea that we actually have Jesus Christ living in us to reveal the genius of God and everything that we do that are revealed for ages to come, that God's going to show off you and I for the ages to come of what's possible when people spend their life revealing his genius, his brilliance, his intelligence. This is why economics and business are crucial to reformation and transformation. Because it actually causes people to lift their head up again and realize there is a future, there is a hope, and we can actually move forward as a society. And it, it comes from people that are craftsmen, that are excellent at what they do. Why are we inspired by the Steve Jobs of the world? Why are we inspired by a band like Beatles? Why are we inspired by them? Because they went out ahead of us and revealed something that no one else could ever reveal. I want to imply to you that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it said we are the workmanship of God. We are the masterpiece of God. So this idea that you have nothing to offer is a, I almost said something I don't want to say, but I believe it, but I won't say it, is an inferior theology. It is poor. It is weak. It is a, it is you have no identity in Christ theology. You actually have the privilege to reveal an aspect of God that no one ever will. That's good. You might not agree with me, but it's true. Yeah. 
you actually, you actually have a distinct responsibility. This is why I say it's not just a privilege and opportunity. It is a mandate on your life. And if you don't take the time to figure out what you have to bring to this planet and to this earth in your lifetime, it will never be revealed again. Why? Because when God created you, he took a part of himself and put him in you. That's what masterpiece is. See, masterpiece in a natural sense, I'm getting way ahead of myself, but oh well, I'm too far down the hole. The masterpiece in a natural sense is rare. You go to Paris, why? To see the Mona Lisa. And there's only one Mona Lisa in the world, and no one will ever create another Mona Lisa. It's, it's pointless. And so masterpieces in a natural sense is the rarity. It's, it's, it's far and few. But we're talking about a creator that everything he does is a masterpiece. And if you talk to anyone that creates a masterpiece, their story will always be, I felt like I took a part of myself and put it on canvas. Or I felt like I took a part of my life and wrote a song about it. What's the point? Anybody that had the ability to create a masterpiece, it is them inside of their masterpiece. They feel like they cut off an arm and created something with it. It is that deep of their soul, their emotion, their spirit, their light. It is a part of them. And so when God created you, he took a part of himself and created you. And he's wanting you to reveal that part of God. That's what a masterpiece is. We are a workmanship and a masterpiece. So don't live your life wondering, man, I guess I just wasn't blessed with certain giftings. No, 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 no. That's, that comes from the Genesis 3 world that we live in. But we are a Genesis 1 blueprint with a trajectory to in Revelation 21 future. Yeah. So if you want to give your life to something, give it to finding out what part of God you're responsible to reveal. What part of God are you have the mandate to show the world? So we have these craftsmen come onto the scene, and they did what they did. They revealed the genius of God. And the result was the oppression left, the demonic strongholds were removed from a nation, uh, two nations and a city. And the result was everybody lifted up their head again. You can read it. They lifted up their head again. Which fun, the very next verse, which is chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 and 3, right in there, you have an angel. So now Zechariah sees this battle scene. There's a victor. There's a winner. There's always a winner. There's no participation trophies. I just wanted to say that right now. I can't stand participation trophies. Uh, you don't even want to get me started on participation. I think most of culture's problem is because we've given out participation trophies. There is a winner, all right? There's always someone that comes out on top. There's nothing, okay, all right, I, I did my, I could go on for a whole message on participation trophies. My brother-in-law gave um, at a, a, his kids go to a school and they were giving out um, awards and everyone in the class got an award. Which just irks some of us. We're like, no, 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 no. Don't call it an award. Call it something else. Call it a certificate. Like, don't water down something. And so he told his son, he said, you know that not everyone's a winner, right? <laughs> he wanted to make sure he knew that this is not an award. This is the certificate that identifies something you're great at. But does, anyway, I'm sorry. I'm going down a hole. That is just, it's my own pet peeve. I'm like, I can't stand participation trophies. So anyway, they're the winner of this battle. Okay, they're the victor here. Someone wins, and the very next part of the vision is this. It, Zechariah sees an angel with a measuring tape. And he looked at this angel and said, what are you doing? And the angel is measuring the city. The context of this vision was about rebuilding cities. What you'll find in the Old Testament predominantly is a passion to rebuild cities. The Lord wants mankind, you and I, to rebuild cities, to rebuild society. Now, that's a dangerous thing to say because most people think that means we run everything. I don't honestly think it means that. There's a kingdom perspective that we have a lot to learn on this. We think, oh, hierarchical, I'm going to be in charge. I'm going to be in charge. I do feel that some people are called to actually be in charge. But does it mean the church becomes in charge? That's an entirely different conversation that I have no time to unpack at all. I think we're actually designed. I just made a bunch of you like, whoa, you just... And I'll leave it there. I'll let your pastors clean that one up. <laughs> Bless you. 
so they're measuring the city, rebuilding the city, and the Zechariah goes, what are you doing? And the angel said, I am measuring the city to get all the resources necessary to rebuild the city. So if you can imagine, I'm just, I'm just going to make it really simple. He had a clipboard. Okay, the city is this long, that wide, the walls are this tall. They're going to need this much quarry, this much stone. They're going to need this much wood, metal. He's making an order, a list of, of material to order to rebuild the city. It's an amazing sequence of events here. What I want to show you today is this. Sometime you follow heaven. God goes before you. He paved the way. He does all the work for you, and then you roll in behind God, and you get to enjoy the benefits and the fruit. In this story, it's actually the opposite. They go before heaven, reveal the genius of God, and as a result of that, heaven comes behind them to give everything necessary to rebuild the city. This, I believe, their keys and strategies of how to go into oppressed neighborhoods how to go into impressed, oppressed businesses, how to go into oppressed nations and regions in the world. This is the strategy of heaven is to reveal the genius of God that removes the oppression from a nation and then the Lord will send resources behind to rebuild and actually create a society that continues to reflect the genius of God. This is reformation and this is transformation. And so Zechariah is obviously amazed by that. Okay, how much time? Okay, I got a few more minutes here. Now would you turn with me to, are you guys still with me? Okay, I want you to turn with me to um, the book of Exodus. I want to I wanna unpack a little bit more. It may not be necessary, but I'm going to do it anyways. Exodus chapter 31. Exodus 31. Okay. Now, just to give a quick context, the book of Exodus... If you're not aware, the, the book about the nation of Israel exiting Egypt. This was their grand exodus. But we are down the road a little bit of when they've left Egypt. We are now in the part where they're in the wilderness, and what we jokingly say, they just went around the mountain for 40 years. They're, they're at the beginning stages of that, which they don't know that yet, but they definitely have a long road ahead of themselves. You know, sometimes it you know, takes 400 years to get into freedom, but sometimes you need 40 years to get slavery out of you. And that's what happens here. It took 40 years to get Egypt out of Israel. Because God wants to send you into your promise, but he doesn't want you to sabotage it. So sometimes you have to go through a season where he's uprooting slavery mentality, inaccurate, inferior identity. He's uprooting that because if he wants you to move into the promised land to sustain it, know how to live in it, and steward it for the future generation. And Israel was not ready for that. So now they're entering into the 40-year process of uprooting that. And so in the middle of that, God makes it clear, I want to dwell among my people. So in the earlier parts of Exodus, all the way up to this moment, Moses numerous times is going up the mountain to be with the Lord. And this is the stuff that we mentioned earlier about. He would go into the presence of the Lord in such a way that the byproduct of him being in the presence was what? He was physically glowing. Talk about being in the glory, that he was physically glowing. They had to put a veil because the nation wouldn't know what to do with that. So Moses is going up. Now, the other thing we have to realize, what is Moses doing when he's up on the mountain? Obviously, he's in the glory in the presence, but he's actually getting download of what society is going to look like. What does it look like to me to be God's people? So the Ten Commandments came, the law, the tabernacle, all these things Moses was getting in the presence of God. And if I can imply to you that he was actually shaping culture and society with Moses, this is what it means to be God's people. And he's laying out the framework for what society would eventually built upon. And one of the things that Moses got was a download of a place of meeting, excuse me, a tabernacle, a tent. So Moses gets this blueprint of a tent, a tabernacle, and understandably, his response was, I don't don't, don't know how to build this. I don't have the skill set to build this. So this is where we pick up the story in chapter 31, verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the spirit of wisdom and understanding in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship. We can continue to read, but we'll just stop right there. This is the first person in human history to be filled with the spirit of God. 
which is pretty fascinating. Could you know who went before this guy? Adam and Eve. Moses. I mean, some amazing men and women. And God didn't put his spirit in them, but he chose the guy, a no-name guy. The reason why we know his name today is because of this moment. Isn't it interesting that before the Holy Spirit falls in Acts chapter 2, before it was going to be common to be filled with the Spirit of God, again, God goes, you know what? I'm going to put my spirit in this guy. And so Bezalel comes to Moses. I don't know what that looked like, but the Spirit of God filled him in all wisdom. And now Bezalel, we know he was a craftsman by nature. He, this is what he would, he already knew how to build things. But when the Spirit of God came on him, he was able to build something that no one else had the ability to. That's what's important to understand. What's the difference between a man full of the wisdom of God and someone that does not have the wisdom of God? When you don't have the wisdom of God, you can do what's humanly possible. But when you have the wisdom of God, you begin to enter into dimensions of doing things that's not humanly possible. We have to understand that this is, this is what separates us from the pack, if I can say that. This is what separates the men from the boys, the women from the girls. This is what separates is when you have the favor and the wisdom of the Lord on your life, you're able to do things that only he wants done and only you'll be able to accomplish. I don't know if you got that, but it, it's, pretty, it's pretty important to understand. So Bezalel gets filled with the Spirit of God and wisdom and understanding, and Moses said, hey, God wants us to build this. So chapter 31, all the way to the end of chapter 39, I would love for you to read on your own time, especially if this is grabbing you. Those nine, eight chapters is basically the building process. It's when they basically built the tent, the tabernacle, the artifact, all the stuff that was involved in this place of worship that God would actually reside. They built it. It's not boring to read. It's just more factual. The dimension is, is 50 cubits this way, two cubits that. It's all the, it's the building plan. But what's fascinating, none of that would be possible without the wisdom of God. Yeah. But I want you to go to a really obscure verse in chapter 35. I love this verse. It's so obscure. It's just kind of tucked away in the middle of the building project. Chapter 35, I believe it's verse, yeah, it's verse 25. So remember, they're in the middle of this building project. All the women, verse 25, all the women who were gifted artisan spun yarn with their hand and brought what they had spun of blue, purple, and scarlet, and fine linen. And all the women whose heart stirred with wisdom spun yarn of goat's hair. It's this little obscure little verse in there, and I always go, God, why is that important to you, that yarn? Why, why did taking up precious space in the Bible talk about making yarn? I think what it was, to be honest with you, because it mattered to God, for one, that's obvious, but women, their hearts were stirred with wisdom. They were able to take something that had no value, goat hair, which is normally swept up and thrown away of some sort. But women, they were stirred of the wisdom, which is the creativity of God, and then looked at it and thought, we can do something with this. We can take it through this process and make yarn of different color, and then we could actually help it to build the, the place that God wants to live. Are you following me? Yeah. Wisdom had the ability to take something of nothing and of no value and to make it of value. There's a very entrepreneurship within the word wisdom in itself. And then in the end of the day, these women got mentioned in the most important book in life because they were triggered with wisdom and to make something out of nothing. Then you go to chapter 39, verse 40, I believe it's 43. 39, verse uh, 43. This is the end of the building project. Bezalel invites Moses to come take a look at what he saw on the mountain, and now it's been built. Verse 43. Then Moses looked over all the work, and indeed they had done it, as the Lord had commanded, just so they had done it, and Moses blessed them. So Bezalel was actually able to walk in a level of wisdom creativity, as we talked about that, he was able to reveal the genius of God in his work that when Moses walked in, he said, this is exactly how I saw it. This is to the T. This is how God wanted it. And he blesses it. And that becomes the place of meeting for many years until the temple was built. So 
So I want to challenge you today. I know this is more of a teaching lecture, and I normally take a lot more time to unpack more of this. I wanted to give a real quick overview of the word wisdom. I believe it's crucial for this country. I believe it's crucial for reformation um, and for transformation, that there has to be a realm of understanding. The word wisdom is much deeper, much wider, much bigger than just good advice. It has a creative force at its, nature, at its core. And you and I have the spirit of wisdom and power living in us, who is who? Jesus Christ. So the idea of not doing things with excellence, with thought, with compassion, all these things, that is, that is, that is a natural expression of Jesus living in us, doing it with thought. Now, we're thankful God can use anything for his good. We're thankful for that. But I want to challenge you. There is... You can actually use your hands. You can run things, make decisions in such a way that people have an encounter with the brilliance, with the genius of God. So my prayer for you as a nation, as for South Africa, is that you would understand this, not just in an intellectual standpoint, but experientially, you'd actually step into a realm of wisdom to experience the genius of God and to make it known that you know how to reveal the genius of God and all that you do. In Jewish culture, the word worship was not music and song only. The word worship can be translated to work really hard. This is why the, when the Greek philosophy came in, we start compartmentalizing our spirituality. We start compartmentalizing what is spiritual and what isn't spiritual. But to the Jewish culture, my entire life is spiritual. And everything I do in life, has, it can be an act of worship to the king. So this is why Jews are excellent at business, because it's an act of worship. It's like, man, when I do this, it's an act of my offering to the Lord. And when I do this, it's an act of offering to the Lord. And you ask most westernized, modern Christian what's spiritual, most of them say, when I go to church, when I pray and read my Bible. What about being a dad? What about being a mom? What about being a CEO? What about being a teacher? You see, we have to go back a little bit to understand that our entire life is meant to be a demonstration of worship to the King. So when I spend time with my wife, it's just as spiritual as it is when I pray to God by myself. It is all one and the same, if you will. It, it's a lifestyle. It's a paradigm. It's a reality of, man, it's this and it's this. My entire life is an offering to the Lord. Not just when I read my Bible, not just when I go to church, and not when I start a home group. All that is wonderful. And it's necessary and so important, but that's not the entirety of what it means to be filled with the Spirit of God, that every area of your life can be an act of worship to the King. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.